Hello, everyone. This is David Bernstein, founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. We are delighted to bring to you today this live stream event on critical social justice and anti-Semitism. As you all know, it is based on the white paper that JILV came out with yesterday. And we are really pleased to have a distinguished panel with us today to talk it through and to think about the various challenges relating to critical social justice ideology and anti-Semitism and to go deeper than we were able to go perhaps um, on the white paper and to talk strategy as well. Um, you, you've all seen the bio, so I'm not gonna read the bios of the people, but briefly we have with us today, Blake Flayton, who is the founder of the New Zionist Congress. Uh, Blake is one of the was one of the premier pro-Israel activists in the U.S. college campus scene, and he's doing a lot of other great things, which he might may or may not tell you about. Um, we have uh, Pamela Pereski, who is the chair of the JILV board. She is also a psychologist, a writer, a researcher, and has done extensive work on anti-Semitism as well. And uh, Lee Jessam, who is the chair of the psychology department at Rutgers University, um, also someone who has written extensively about both critical social justice ideology and anti-Semitism, and both. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Daphna Kaufman. Uh, Daphna is a, a consultant, um, a researcher, a strategist. Uh, she's done a lot of work with the Riyut Group um, and has been writing about these issues in a very, uh, very uh, deep way in the past several months. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them all. Um, I'm going to briefly uh, summarize the seven points in the white paper. So we have a bit of a common framework we're talking about, and then we'll move into discussion with our guests. So we talked about seven distinct ways, distinct but related ways that critical social justice ideology fans the flame of, of anti-Semitism. And the first is the canard of Jewish privilege. Um, as we know, this idea of Jewish privilege tracks very closely with the idea of, of Jewish power controlling uh, society from behind the scenes. And it provides a permission structure for when you talk about privilege in general, and you talk about a hierarchy of privilege, it provides a permission structure to also talk about Jewish privilege, which we've seen over and over again, and that's being weaponized against Jews. The second is um, the erasure of Jewish identity. This is something that uh, Daphna Kaufman has written extensively about. It's about the idea that Jews do not easily fit into this sort of oppressor, oppressed uh, paradigm, this uh, this distinction that they're drawing, and therefore it, it forces them into sort of a white paradigm that many Jews don't feel captures their identity. And I'm sure Daphne and others will go into that in greater depth. Third is uh, intersectionality and anti-Semitism. Um, and here, um, you're all familiar with the concept of intersectionality, which can serve as a multiplier of some of these various ideas around Jews. Um, one, when, organ when, when individual groups feel a sense of pressure to, to stand in solidarity with each other around ideas of oppression and oppressed, that can then be used to sort of, uh, to single out groups like Jews who don't fit the paradigm easily. Um, the next is this uh, idea of the anti-Israel binary. This is pretty straightforward. When you speak about oppressors and oppressed, and that's the entirety of your worldview, um, it's going to be easily applied and is easily applied to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which takes into account none of the complexities of the Israel-Palestinian or Israel-Arab situation. Uh, number five is the idea of marginalizing Jews in politics. While this is not explicitly anti-Semitism, the idea will be that if these ideas grain so much ground in uh, political circles that American Jews may feel increasingly disenfranchised from both political parties. Um, six is equity. Um, there's a new concept of equity that uh, that uh, we see from the writings of Abraham X. Kendi. Um, the idea is that um, that all disparities among groups are prima facie evidence of discrimination and racism. And when you hold that one group. Uh, is being discriminated against, and the only cause of it could be oppression, then anybody who is who is doing well, any group that is associated with success, like Jews and Asians in particular, are then going to be targeted for doing the oppression, for being complicit in white supremacy. 
And uh, seventh is, uh, is that critical social justice ideology underlines our enlightenment values. And we live in a society that was built on the enlightenment, uh, built on the free expression of ideas. And when that is undermined, Jews and all other minorities uh, suffer for it. So those were the ideas that we put forth. We also put forth several strategies that we can discuss as well. But why don't we start first with our general observation? And for that, I think I'll start with Lee Jessup. Lee. You have to unmute yourself, Lee. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I think the paper was really just a, very, a great, succinct summary of the sort of multifaceted nature of the threat uh, that critical social justice theory brings to Jews. Um, so, uh, um, I, you know, I think the, uh, the part I found, I think for people who are not familiar with it, this is a great, it's just a great introduction. Um, and for people who are familiar with it, um, and you know, I've been doing, as you said in the intro, I've been doing stuff like this for a while now. Um, it was the stuff at the end. Like, what are we? What are the tactical and strategic responses to this? That for me, for me, that was in some ways the most valuable part. I mean, for someone who's not familiar with the stuff, the whole paper would be, is great. So I think I'm just going to stop there. Okay, and we will go into some greater detail and depth into what are some of the strategic recommendations. Um, why don't I turn it over to Daphna, who has also spent a lot of time analyzing these trends and continues to do that. Um, thank you. So uh, I think, you know, I also, I very much um, uh, aligned with the premises of the paper and specifically the description of the, the, the way that critical social justice fuels uh, anti-Semitism. And I think, you know, the, you know, if they can call it good news, but sort of good news is that uh, the, in terms of the description of the phenomenon, I think it's so much more prevalent in our internal Jewish community discourse. You know, I, I think that there have been great strides in kind of understanding this conceptual clash between uh, contemporary progressive discourse and the Jewish experience. Um, and I, I think that we're really at a point, a very critical point of moving more concretely into discussing how to respond uh, to these. And those are the questions that are also very interesting to me and interesting in, in looking at the paper. Um, and my observation, uh, I don't, it doesn't uh, negate the basis of the approach described in the paper because fundamentally my vantage point is that it really does take uh, a diversity of instruments in the orchestra of approaches in order to, to tackle such a, a systemic um, so systemic and very decentralized challenge. Um, but when I look, and that's, that's my frame, the kind of potential for uh, a broader Jewish communal mobilization that's specifically focused on this challenge, then there is a departure point that emerges between whether uh, what you're going to go after, how you're going to define the challenge, which is critical for how you're going to shape your, your response, whether that's kind of going against wokeness uh, writ large, kind of what that means, if it's a theoretical framework, the accompanying discourse, you know, how fundamentally, or whether it's um, looking at Jewish representation within that discourse. And it's you know it's kind of a, it's kind of a reform and impact upon contemporary progressive discourse, or uh, reject you know the the underlying theoretical premise and and go against that. And here and again you know kind of looking from the Jewish communal perspective, I think that given the societal moment that we're in, the extent that these issues are so kind of, um, evolving and so much. Um, um, uh, impacted upon by these rapidly changing contextual environment factors uh, that it's it's too soon to kind of plant a flag and make a wholesale rejection of uh, of you know it, it's 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 almost also a question of what to call it a particular framework or the discourse that evolves because there are there are, there are, there are many shades of it um, and, uh, 
yeah, I, I don't know if I don't know if now is the time to go into detail, but you know, it's kind of an argument that I've been having with myself for for a while. There are a few a few kind of uh, factors uh, that have influenced my thinking. That if it's relevant to the conversation later, uh, happy to go into that. But given a goal of impacting upon uh, upon the discourse, uh, there's kind of a corollary of what is the Jewish role in doing so? And I believe m most effective uh, and, I, and I guess most authentic is focusing on staking the claim for the Jewish voice in representing the Jewish lived experience, identity, and vulnerability in contemporary progressive discourse. I think that that's where we can make an impact and that's where we can build co uh, more or more relatively unified coalitions within the Jewish community. And that's kind of the, the, the stake I would claim or the, the flag I would plant. Okay, and I think that's a very interesting point and one we should discuss. You know, we, re we reached a pivot point in California this last year where there were Jewish organizations that were arguing um, to try to get the best possible deal in an ethnic studies curriculum. And there were those that were trying to reject the ideology altogether. Um, and I guess in my own mind, I've been on both sides of that equation and increasingly moved away from the idea that we should be engaged in the internal conversation because th that's actually producing some of the anti-Semitism. But, but I don't think that that's a settled question. It should be a settled question. I think that's something that we should, we should invite some discussion around and we will get to that shortly. But before, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Blake now. Hi, so happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, would you mind repeating? You know, we've talked we've talked a lot. Would you would you, would you mind repeating the uh, the ultimate question? Well, the, the, I think one is there's two questions I guess on the table. One is there any particular observation about how this ideology fans the flame of anti-Semitism that you'd like to sort of talk about? or what the Jewish strategy should be in the face of these ideological trends? So uh, I'll cover the first one. Uh, I'll cover both of them, but I'll, I'll cover the first one um, and, and kind of tie it into my second answer for what we can do to combat it. So um, I think that what we are seeing right now, one of the, uh, one of the main points uh, of the, uh, you know, the seven components of critical social justice reasoning for why they fuel anti-Semitism was the erasure of Jewish identity, right? The denial that the Jews are their own distinct separate people who have the right to self-determination. And that is evidently true. And nowhere is that more true than in anti-Israel spaces uh, on campus. And I speak you know, from the campus experience because I just graduated college uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so what you hear in these spaces all the time is that Israel is a colonialist uh, outpost. It is an imperialist project. It is simply an extension of the United States and sometimes Western Europe, but a lot of times the United States is used because people like to demonize things like APAC. And as we saw in the Nina Turner uh, versus Chantel Brown uh, race, uh, DMFI. Um, how, and the, the ideology behind that is that Jews are just like any other white people. Jews don't have uh, their own distinctive uh, ethnicity. They don't have their own distinctive nationality. They don't have their own distinctive indigeneity to this specific piece of land. And if it, it is a complete flattening of our identity into just the majority, and I speak of the majority as in the majority white Christian population in America and Western Europe. And that is very, very dangerous because one, it uh, encourages uh, people to ignore, uh, you know, flare-ups of anti-Semitism because they don't know how to address it correctly because we are being positioned very high on the privilege pyramid and we're just being lumped together with the oppressor category. Um, and two, if one believes in that ideology that Judaism is just a religion and that the that Jews are simply just white people with all of the privileges and, 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 and the social uh, uh, luxuries that come with, with being white in these countries, then Israel is you know, a colonialist bastion. And Israel is uh, just an extension of the United States, which leads to anti-Zionism, which I very strongly believe is anti-Semitism. Um, and it's kind of like 
I know this is a sort of a convoluted answer, but you can see how these two feed into each other. Demonizing Israel comes from erasing Jewish identity and erasing Jewish identity uh, is a conduit to then demonizing Israel even more. So the two are very, very interconnected. Now, what we can do to combat it um, is I would say when this ideology makes inroads in places like California with the ethnic studies model curriculum, when this ideology makes inroads in elementary schools and middle schools who are teaching, uh, there is curriculum that exists that uh, leans into judging people by the color of their skin and not on the content of their character, puts the world into binaries, segregates groups and assigns a certain amount of privilege and access to truth and, and validity in their identity to some but not others and you know puts everybody on a hierarchy. Regar and I want to emphasize this, regardless if it says anything about Zionism or Israel or directly, you know, accuses the Jews of being, uh, you know, benefactors of white supremacy. And I'm alluding to the California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum because many people in the Jewish community said, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Now it's great. The third draft is great because look, they took all of the problematic stuff out. They took all of the Zionism as racism. Jews were welcomed into whiteness. They took all of that stuff out. So now it's just great. No, it was not great because the foundation of this ethnic studies curriculum was based on critical social justice, was based on social grouping in this very illiberal way. It divided Jews amongst themselves by how much melanin we have in our skin, you know, Ashkenazi versus Mizrahi. It was completely problematic. So the way that we combat this is taking seriously any time these sorts of beliefs and this sort of ideology bubbles up in curriculums, in, uh, you know, corporate job trainings, uh, you know, in, 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 in our armed forces, in anywhere that we can see it and that it is brought to our attention, um, it is incumbent upon us to say something about it. Great. Um, Pamela, you're next, but I, I liked how one of the viewers put it in the chat box about what the ultimate question is. Do Jews try to become a favored victim group for wokeness, or should Jews oppose the concept of wokeness? So I thought that was very clearly stated. So, Pamela, it's all you. Well, thanks. First of all, um, I have to say every time I hear Blake talk, it gives me hope uh, because um, we're obviously at a a, a very, um, a sort of critical moment right now with respect to how Jews are seen in our country and how young people relate to Jews and Judaism and Israel and um, and especially, you know, how young Jews relate to those things. So um, I'm just always so um, heartened when I hear Blake uh, because it, it makes me think that we're going to be in good hands moving forward. Um, but uh, that question is actually, a, I think, a, a really good sort of fundamental question for us to be looking at. And, and, um, and one, of the, one of the things I hear a lot is uh, a complaint that when, when Jews point out this issue about being seen as white, um, that it's sort of like saying we're not uh, we're not being allowed to claim the mantle of victimhood. And that's not what this is about. It's, it's about peoplehood, not victimhood. And I think that that's a, um, a point that's, that's lost because everybody accepts this, this uh, victim versus oppressor sort of paradigm it forces people to be one or the other. So if you're sort of trying to assert that you're not in the oppressor category, it's as if you're trying to assert that you're in the victim category. And, um, and that's not, um, that's that we need to sort of step outside of that paradigm. And that sort of speaks to Daphne's um, conundrum also that, you know, if we want to work within this paradigm, how are we going to do that? Um, and my contention really is that the epistemological sort of underpinnings or presuppositions of the um, of critical theory are are pretty much incompatible with the 
um, the sort of foundational premises of Jewish thought and, and Jewish culture. Um, so, you know, we, we can't um, get any traction if we're inside that paradigm, partly also because um, the, the problem with, uh, and, you know, and one of the criticisms that people have of, of Jews rejecting the whiteness mantle is um, that uh, it's, like I was saying, it's seen as saying like, we're not the white oppressor, we're the non-white uh, victim. And um, that's not, it, it's, it, it's just, um, it's not a Jewish uh, category, white and non-white or white and of color. Like these are not the ways in which, uh, I mean, this is a, another example as in, you know, many times in the past when Jewish identity has been um, uh, kind of um, constructed from the outside and Jews are supposed to accept the uh, non-Jewish um, understanding of what it means to be Jewish, what, what it means to be Jewish, whether it's about a religion or whether it's about a race or whether it's um, about something else, instead of allowing the, the self-determination of our own people. Um, and, and then the other issue with the paradigm is that in um, in uh, in accepting these narratives um, that the critical uh, various critical theories uh, rely on, they're narratives of greed and appropriation and unmerited privilege and hidden power. These are anti-Semitic narratives, mm -hmm. and so it's it's sort of less the problem of Jews being considered white and more the problem that it's as if the, the whole paradigm is saying that white people are too much like Jews. It's, it, it's sort of a, a flip. And that's where we also get this, like, uh, you know, as I wrote in the article in the Sapir Journal, the idea of Jews being hyper white, um, that's compounded because of the narrative but also because of Jewish overrepresentation in all of these fields of, of intellectual inquiry and creativity and uh, finance and in various areas of, of success and status. Um, so that if, you're, if your fundamental presupposition is that any um, outcome disparity is a result of, um, of racism, or bigotry of some kind, and Jews are doing well instead of doing less well, overrepresented instead of underrepresented, then Jews must have colluded with whiteness because whiteness is the oppressor enemy. So like all of these things together, plus the fact that um, anti-Semitism is in part a conspiracy theory about Jews having unmerited privilege and power. And this is what the critical narrative is. It's not just that Jews have unmerited privilege and power, but it is also that Jews have unmerited privilege and power. So instead of teaching that anti-Semitism is that, uh, that conspiracy theory, it teaches that Jews have unmerited privilege and power. So that's, that is fundamentally anti-Semitic, and I don't know that there's a way around that inside, the, inside that paradigm. Lee, let's turn to you. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, so I think I have two things that I want to say. Uh, I, you know, the terms wokeness and critical social justice, like I know what they mean. I know what you mean. They're, they're really vague and amorphous. And it's kind of weird to be either for them or against them because they're so broad and sprawling. Like if what wokeness means is schools should teach the Tulsa riots, I'm fine. If that's what wokeness means, I'm in. Schools should teach the uh, the, the Tulsa riots. Uh, you know, they should be, kids should learn about the history of Jim Crow. Uh, the, the, the problem is when it spills over into the kinds of intolerance and authoritarianism that you know that 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 
uh, Gaffner and Blake and, and Pamela have already discussed. That's the problem. And it's not all of critical social justice. It's not all of wokeness. It really depends. But that's the core. I, to me, that's the, really the core problem. That's that's number one. And, and that, that uh, to me, that allows to sort of s solve Daphne's problem to some degree, right? Well, should we be within? Should we be without? And like, I get that. That's a real dilemma for many people. But I, it's like, I, I, you know, uh, if what we're talking about is authoritarianism, if we're talking about, you know, denial of Jewish identity, then, I, you know, I don't want to be part of that. <laughs> I'm just not, you know, sorry. I mean, I really need profanity to describe my attitude towards that. Um, uh, so, so, um, so but, but not all of it is like that. And it just, it, it, so, so that part depends. That's number one. Number two, I think I kind of want to make a different, a somewhat different point here. Than has been made so far, um, you know, the discussion so far, you know, for good reasons, has focused primarily on Jews, almost exclusively uh, on Jews. And now, you know, I know I've talked with you, David, about this separately. Um, the the problem uh, with uh, wokeness goes way beyond Jews, um, and uh, I think there's some risk of when Jews discussing uh, discuss this, which, you know, we should and we can discuss it as Jews, uh, that's fine, um, uh, sort of missing an opportunity to forge broad alliances with all sorts of other people who are similarly targeted by this, 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 you know, this toxic movement. So, I, you know, I just, I have a couple of sources up here. Um, there's a, uh, uh, and, and, and to some extent, it, it, I'm also, so I'm going to read a little bit from this, this source. Th there's also a weird reversal of direction. So we think about kind of the, the bad ways that uh, this produces bad things for Jews, that it's, you know, it's, in, it's implicitly or inherently anti-Semitic, but it goes the other way also. That is classic anti-Semitic conspiratorial type thinking is now manifesting in the rhetoric of sort of the sort of radical left rhetoric on whiteness. So I want to just read you, this is a paper, a peer reviewed academic paper, Journal of the American Psychoanalytic uh, Association. The title is on having whiteness. Now, just as I read it, just, I, you just replace white or whiteness with Jews. And it, it just sounds like Nazi propaganda. Parasitic whiteness. Okay, since that, <laughs> this is part of Nazi propaganda from the get-go. Jews were parasites. They were right. They, they were they were insects that were sucking the blood of the Aryan nation. But okay, uh, parasitic whiteness renders its hosts' appetites voracious, insatiable, and perverse. These deformed appetites particularly target non-white peoples. Once established, these appetites are nearly impossible to eliminate. And it just goes on like this. I mean, this is like demented stuff. I mean, if it wasn't for academia having gone completely off the, you know, the deep end of the left side of the spectrum, this, this would be rejected as insanity, as, as delusional, conspiratorial insanity reminiscent of Nazi era propaganda. So, you know, now, I mean, this, this does has narrow relevant to Jews for all the reasons that everybody else has talked about. To the extent that Jews are just part of the on having whiteness problem, then this describes Jews. But the point is, it goes, this problem goes way beyond Jews. And I would really, I, I think I'm going to end with urging not just us, a, anybody who pays attention to this, anyone who's paying attention to these sorts of problems, uh, to, to think long and hard about forging alliances with other people and groups who see this in much the similar way that we do. Yeah, thank you for that, Lee. By the way, I should let you know that the JILV is very busy building alliances on this front. We're working closely, for example, with Chinese American groups, and we're developing potentially a joint statement that we're going to be releasing with Chinese American groups in the coming months. And we've been working with black heterodox thinkers as well. And there'll be many, many more opportunities for engagement. That's exactly the kind of coalition that we talked about in the paper where we said we should create a new centrist coalition. So that is very much on our minds. And I really appreciate you uh, emphasizing that. Daphna, why don't I turn to you? Great. 
Um, so I'd like to make two points. Um, I don't think my perspective differs uh, very much uh, from, from Lee's. I uh, think that the ESMC and other examples also that Pamela presented are what I would call uh, extreme, rigid, and dogmatic applications of theoretical frameworks. And I think I differentiate between that and something a bit more loose and amorphous, the contemporary progressive discourse, many of which draws upon these frameworks. And I also look at the potential and actual positive contribution of the sensitizing framework of understanding skin color as a factor versus the rigid application of skin color being the way to describe reality in an exclusive sense. So I, I, the, the difference I see is, could this be looked at as a spectrum with helpful ideas to inform a broader perspective of how to look at society? And I think most people would say, yeah, there, we could use a little more sensitization about certain issues inside discourse, or is it used in a, you know, totalitarian authoritarian sense to cut off discussion and be presented as the one and only real and, uh, and authentic way to see the world. So that's one. And the second, I, I, I think another, you know, binary, non-binary kind of designation, I, I, it's, I, I don't, um, it, the question is not whether, or for me, it's not uh, going with the strategy of engaging the progressive far left. The question is that when you're looking at the center, the center left, the Jewish left, the Jewish center, do you define the problem as the extremity and rigidity of the application of these frameworks? Or do you say we as a Jewish collective have to go against this influence in our society writ large? I think that's a, that's a somewhat more, more complicated question. Mm. Yeah, that's a very nuanced reframing of the discussion. Pamela, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, um, what Lee was talking about was completely um, what I've been thinking in terms of how the the anti-Semitic narratives are now applied to whiteness, and that you know, of course, amplifies the anti-Semitic nature because those anti-Semitic conspiracy theories al already sort of live in people's minds um, about Jews. So when that becomes the way that people think about whiteness in general, and then you add to that, that people think of most Jews as being white, then it amplifies the anti-Semitism that's targeted against Jews and, you know, by amplifying the same anti-Semitic narratives being targeted against white people. Um, there are other issues too with this in that um, in, in the intersectional paradigm that like as Daphne was saying, there are, there are very valuable things in, and, and we said this too, and I know Blake believes this also, but there are valuable aspects to the, uh, you know, the attempts to the, to the ways of trying to grapple with racism and bigotry of all kinds and the intersectional way of, of looking at things started with something extremely valuable, that there's a, uh, a legal loophole, or there was a legal loophole for discrimination that um, when you were, when, when a company discriminated against um, a, a group of people on the basis of the intersection of two protected categories, as long as they weren't discriminating against people from either of those protected categories separately, they could get away with it. So, you know, black women could not get jobs at, at GM, but black men could and white women could. So that's a very valuable application of um, of intersectionality, and that's something we need to retain. We need to be able to notice the ways in which there's a multiplier effect um, when people come from different, um, you know, dis groups that are discriminated against when there's actual discrimination. But that's not really the primary way in which that that primary that that uh, paradigm is being used now. And so that's where we have to extract the value. And, and try to discard the, the, the stuff that's, that's not just not valuable, but harmful. The other thing is that 
that this is not just about Jews, as, as Lee was saying, it's about pluralism. It's about liberal democracy. It's about our willingness to share our country with people who think differently than we do, people who practice differently than we do. Um, and it's about notions of harm. It, you know, it's become the, the case that we, we now sort of think that other people not thinking what we think and saying things that, that, um, that are in opposition to the, the things we hold dear, uh, that's harmful. And, and that is a, that's a new place to be, that, that that's considered harmful, whereas that's supposed to be what a pluralist liberal democracy is. And so in that, in that sort of a culture, we're not encouraged to maintain an open mind. Judaism teaches us and our you know, Jewish culture, Jewish thinking is about argument. It's about, you know, our, our heroes argue, you know, argue with God even. If you can argue with God, you can argue with another person, right? And it's not, if it doesn't hurt you and it doesn't hurt God to argue with God, then you can argue with another person. And, and that's a lost understanding, even, uh, you know, in, in some corners of our, our Jewish community, that we have to be able to love each other and argue with each other, be part of a family. Uh, you know, we can argue with, with Jews about Israel, about anything, you know, we can argue with non-Jews, we can argue with each other in this country about anything, and the argument is not the harm. It's you know, you, you might make the case that if somebody believes something and acts on that, that's harmful. But then the important thing is to make a persuasive argument against that thing. And we're, we're losing the opportunity to make that argument because we're not allowing the, the ideas to be disseminated that we think are harmful. So then we can't grapple with them anymore. But this is, you know, this is a, a, a matter of, of preserving a plural liberal democracy in addition to allowing Jews to thrive and be safe. Thank you. Well said. Blake. So that was that was very important, Pamela, and obviously I uh, agree. Um, I want to bring it back to this organization meeting that I went to when I was a, a sophomore in college. It was one of the first weeks of school. And there was an organization that was meeting and I was invited to go. And even though I disagreed with many of these things, many of the things that this organization stood for, I've always kind of classified myself as a political masochist. Um, I love to hear different viewpoints. I love to read books that I, of uh, the content that I strongly disagree with. Um, and one of, during the first couple minutes of, of this meeting, the, the people who were running it, the leaders of the organization, presented us uh, with this, this new method of running uh, a meeting called Progressive Stack, uh, which essentially means that while we're discussing something, while we're having a conversation on a political topic, uh, who can speak first, who gets called on first when their hands uh, are raised, depends entirely upon their immutable characteristics, otherwise known as how oppressive, how oppressed they are, how uh, far to the bottom of the intersectionality uh, hierarchy they are, or the, uh, you know, the pyramid of privilege. Um, you know, which means that if you are, you know, a person of color, um, who is a gender minority, who is a sexual minority, a religious minority, and has a disability, you're at the front of the line, right? And just the average white student, male, heterosexual, uh, might have to wait a little bit for him to be called on, um, regardless of what is being discussed. So what does this do, first I will say, is this completely shreds the notion of a meritocracy. Because let's say we're discussing something like housing and urban development, and that white kid in the back uh, who, who believes in, in the left-wing ideas of this organization and you know, wants to implement these, these sort of ideas in, in, into policies you know, for, you know, let's say, planning a new zone in the city of New York. Um, let's say he's working to get his PhD right, in this subject and knows a lot about it. Why is he not given the opportunity to uh, speak, 
right? Why should it matter what he looks like or which faith he practices or doesn't practice or who he is sexually attracted to in order to pitch in his two cents? And the issue of meritocracy is very, you know, hot in the news right now uh, in regards to standardized test scores, you know, being shredded uh, at different uh, uh, academies um, in regards to, you know, whose pitches get printed in a newspaper, uh, in, even in regards to, you know, the Academy Awards and litmus tests on how many people uh, of a certain background versus how many people of not a certain background can be allowed into your movie uh, to be considered for an Oscar. Now I want to turn, and, and so it's undemocratic. It's, ant, it's, it's antithetical to the components of liberal democracy, you know, that encourage people to contribute to their field and be experts in their field in order to make society better as a whole, you know, for a false sense of fairness or what is now called with a glistening glow of political correctness, equity, because who would, who would ever object to something that's, that's named equity. It sounds like a great word. Um, and this is what Pamela was talking about earlier in regards to, uh, you know, equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. Um, and then there's the Jews, right? Now, where do we fit if we're, you know, looking at the ideology and, and, and the application of progressive stack? Where does Jewishness fit into any of that? You know, is, is, is who am I in front of and who am I behind in the order of when I can speak? And who sets those rules? Is it subjective to the person running the meeting? Oh, well... I raise, let's say I raise my hand to the person sitting next to me, raise my hand. I'm, you know, Jewish and gay, but maybe he's Jewish and has a mental disability. Well, who gets, you know, first, this, this is a discursive swamp. There is no, you know, <laughs> people say it's rigidity, this ideology, but it's really not rigid. It's sort of anything goes. It's subjective to who the, what the latest, you know, thread on Twitter said this morning as to, you know, who gets, who, who ha now has more access to truth and who now is the victim versus who needs to shut up. Um, and so th there are those in the Jewish community who on the, if they're on the left, uh, the majority of them, and they understand that left-wing anti-Semitism is a problem. But their solution, uh, and it's very annoying, I'll just say, it's kind of a, you know, not an academic word, but it's, it's very annoying. Their uh, proposed solution to fix this is to just, you know, sit at those tables and, you know, start spewing all the different ways that Jews should have the right to speak, you know, uh, we can talk about pogroms, we can talk about the Inquisition, we could talk about the Holocaust, we can talk about, you know, the rise in anti-Semitic violence in the United States, which is, of course, a thing, you know, I think the FBI reports from a couple of days ago say that, you know, we're more than 57% of the, um, the religious motivated hate crimes. We could bring all of our baggage for 5,000 years back as a people, and we could, you know, talk till we're blue in the face about all of the different manifestations of anti-Semitism today, whether from, you know, Middle Eastern imperialism and, and Middle Eastern anti-Zionism to far right extremism in Europe and the United States. We can put it all on the table. It still will not get us the respect from these people that we are looking for because they have made up their minds. If you are not convinced that they have not made up their minds and that they have made up their minds, look at what happened in May during the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas. It was a dumpster fire. It felt like all of these Jewish college students were in my Instagram DMs like, oh my God, what is happening here? Uh, my friends, my, my, my peers, my colleagues refuse to say anything relating to the Jews and Jewish things. Um, even as people are being beaten and assaulted in Times Square and in Los Angeles, our elected officials are refusing to condemn anti-Semitism on its face. Uh, you know, representatives of Congress are on the floor of the House and tethering police violence in the United States to the state of Israel and, and are lending their voices to the most extreme anti-Zionist rhetoric. What is going on here? And my, the, 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 you know, the assistant dean of Rutgers University is apologizing for condemning anti-Semitism. Uh, people are losing their jobs because they're, they're denouncing what's going on in American cities. 
And my response to that is, what did you expect? We've been telling you this forever. These are the fruits of your labors in trying to get a seat at that table. So the answer to it is, if we as Jews see something that is undemocratic, that is illiberal, it doesn't matter how much progressive, shiny, enlightened language it uses to convince you that it's justice. Um, it's not good for us because totalitarian, anti-democratic ecosystems are never good for us. We as a people are the collective embodiment, like Pamela said, of pluralism, of tolerance, of collectivism. And anything that goes against that, no matter what it tries to say to convince you that it's not, is, is, is toxic and we cannot lend ourselves to it. It's only gonna end a disaster as it already has. Hmm. Well, thank you, Blake. Um, I'm gonna throw in another question from the audience and feel free to either respond to it or, um, or continue on this thread. Um, from Nancy Lisker, who's a good friend and colleague of mine. Um, can we go back to the question of wokeness, the pressure it exerts on Jewish college students and oftentimes their parents who don't want to contradict them? I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago, it was sort of an open letter to uh, Jewish grandparents and parents, stop deferring to your hyper woke kids. Um, you know, you can, you can stand up for liberalism. But I know that that's been an ongoing theme and I've even heard from philanthropists that they have a trouble making investments in these issues because they're so worried about how it will affect their their kids. So um, so um, thank you, Nancy, for the question. Um, Daphne, do you want to respond to anything that you just heard or to that question? I, I you know I, I I feel like it's a it's a bit of a, of a reiteration, but uh, I think that you know I I it's very hard for me to think of a defensible position that is for the kind of, as Blake described it, anti-democratic and totalitarian imposition of, of a thought system. I don't, I, I don't see that as being uh, incongruous with, un, with, with the influence of understanding the factor of race as a sensitizing framework as in uh, understanding different processes of societal change. And I don't think it's a question again of getting a seat at the progressive table. I think it's a question of what you're attacking and under tacking wholesale the, uh, the frameworks and the accompanying discourse that puts an extra and put an extra emphasis on skin color or other factors um, I, I think there's a difference between that and ESMC and, and, and other examples. Um, I, al I also agree with Pamela that the question is not of uh, saying Jews are more or less white or more or less or, or more or less oppressed. I think the question is one of defining who has the right within progressive discourse or any discourse to represent their own experience, whether the prevalent terms they're being framed in are racial or something completely different that we have not yet contemplated. I don't think it's a question, it's a question of, of having the agency to defy those categories, to assert oneself within them, but it's the question of agency regarding representing one's own narrative within the discourse. To me, that's the central question of the that the central challenge that the Jewish community faces. Right. I'm just going to chime in here on that for a second. You know, it seems to me that when we talk about whether it's critical race theory or critical social justice ideology, we can be talking about a very specific theoretical framework, which I think you're saying, Davna, um, that that theoretical framework holds that there can be bias and oppression built into the systems and structures of society. And someone can make a systems level claim about a particular institution. So we could say what happened in Flint, Michigan was systemic racism and here's how I know. And you could argue that that is utilizing the CRT lens. Um, but so often and maybe almost overwhelmingly the majority of time, it's not actually expressed in that way. It's expressed that systemic racism is a 
is the only explanatory factor permitted in a conversation. And if you deviate from that script, you are engaging in a kind of racism yourself. And I think that, it, so one of the reasons why I have a hard time getting my head around what you're saying, Daphna, is that I increasingly in the discourse, maybe it wouldn't have been the case even a year ago, I'm having a hard time finding examples of people who are using that former framework on its own, just as a, as a sort of kind of analysis, and, and much more often um, uh, hearing it attached to this sort of standpoint epistemology claims, the idea that only those with lived experience, only those who can claim to be oppressed have the right to speak and have the right to participate in the conversation. Lee, you haven't uh, joined in for a while. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what you just described, David, is uh, what, what, what makes my head spin is not only does it describe the social cultural discourse, it describes the discourse among academic social scientists who you would think would be committed to actually understanding whatever phenomena they're seeking to understand. You know, what, one of the most recent manifestations of this is the move to abandon standardized testing. Just, it's like, oh, well, you know, the test produced differences. So let's not, you know, we, we don't want to see the, like, if we don't look at the differences, then they, they go away. <laughs> it's like, this is like, this is magical thinking. It's completely magical thinking. And it, it, it's, that's just one, one piece of this. And as a result of that, that, it has become very, very difficult to, act, to actually uh, attempt to understand any kind of social issue, social justice-related issue, social inequality, because there's really only one kind of acceptable answer, and it's an answer that validates some sort of social justice narrative. That is, it's, it's, it's systemic racism, it's prejudice, it's discrimination. And if it's anything other than that, then your, your career is at, at severe risk in, in academia, which is where most of the social science is being conducted. Um, and so that as a society, that, that corrodes the society's ability to actually grapple with its actual social problems because only one set of answers is acceptable. And really, you know, some, sometimes it might actually be the right answer, but there are plenty of times when it probably is not the right answer. So the, the and this, you know, I'm talking about academia in particular, but actually this problem, uh, you know, sometimes it's referred to as cancel culture. Um, what, what it has produced is ever increasing self-censorship on the part of people in social discourse. So the paper recently came out by a couple of political scientists. Self-censorship is at the highest levels in the United States since the 1950s. And, you know, so no, these people aren't getting canceled because they're keeping their mouth shut, which means they're not expressing their views, which means as a society, we have an impoverished ability to negotiate our differences and understand, you know, both where things have come from and what how we want things to be. Okay, so what is the solution to that? No one knows. I'm not claiming I know what the solution is to that. But, uh, you know, you, you don't, you know, you don't go, you know, you, you don't come prepared for an argument to a knife fight. And this is an, when people are losing jobs because they say the wrong thing, they write the wrong thing, they tweet the wrong thing. It's, you know, for all practical purposes, it's a professional knife fight. So, so now what do you do? Then the question really very quickly becomes, what do you do about all that? And that there's probably lots of answers. And you're doing a lot of this now, David, uh, you know, and, and it's really good to see. Part of the answer is to create new networks, new social and professional networks of people who believe, you know what, we really should be able to talk about stuff. <laughs> and, you know, and if you say what you think here, you're not going to get fired. No one here is going to fire you. Um, and, you know, you need the network because un if people are operating solo, they are vulnerable to these sorts of attacks. 
if you are embedded in an, a, a network, a supportive network, who doesn't necessarily support your beliefs, but simply supports your right to express your beliefs, now you have, you know, sort of a security blanket. You have, uh, a, a, you know, uh, um, um, uh, some measure of protection when the mob comes for you. And, I, you know, as far as I can tell, you know, th th it's going to get worse before it gets worse. The mobs are out there. They're still coming for you. They are going to continue to come for you. And so, the, uh, you know, they're coming for you with a, a metaphorical professional equivalent of a knife. And so the question is, how are you going to fight them off? Who'd like to chime in? I, I can jump in. You know, one of the things that, that Lee is talking about is, um, is how uh, the self-censorship leads to um, something called the pluralistic illusion. Um, you know, self-censorship is, is part of what social scientists call the call preference falsification. So people are, are um, either by not stating their real views, their real preferences, they're um, allowing people to think that their views are false. Like the, the, think of the think of their views as uh, as going along with the orthodoxy when that's false. So they falsely assert, or they might even openly say things that they don't actually believe in order to just get along, and that leads to other people thinking that uh, that they're in the minority when they disagree. And the, and all of the data seem to show that that these very extreme views are a very small minority of people. So there are a couple of things that happen here. One is that people um, self-censor in order to um, you know not be attacked and in order to you know maintain their standing and their sense of belonging with their, with their tribe. Um, and then people around them don't know that uh, what their true views are, and then they are more likely to self-censor themselves, and this is just a spiral. Um, and then um, we have this idea, we tend to think of our opposition as more extreme than they are, um, but in this case, in a way, we're doing something that's the opposite, in that when, when people try to oppose these very extreme kinds of interpretations, these, you know, what we're calling critical social justice. But the what we're really talking about is a very illiberal, um, you know, very authoritarian kind of, uh, of view. Um, people have been missing the, um, they, they, they have been giving a lot of benefit of the doubt because we don't want to see racism. We don't want things to be, um, we want to get along. We want to eradicate racism. We want to eradicate bigotry of all kinds. And so when somebody says, here's how you do it, we jump in. Um, and that's the opposite of a racist society, a systemically racist society. You know, we, we really want a, a very non-racist society as a, as a country. Um, and we're willing to overlook a lot of... Um, troubling things in order to try to join the effort. And so then what happens is that when people like us try to um, sort of combat the very extreme versions of these things, the, then people, um, uh, they, they sort of frame it as if we're trying to uh, prevent people from being less racist. We're trying to prevent uh, racism from being overcome. Um, and, and so then it just sort of the whole thing just spirals. It's, it's, a, it's a system that keeps itself in place where people are even more likely to self-censor because they'll be called racist if they speak up. However, one thing that we do know and what Lee was pointing to is that there's safety in numbers. So the more people who are willing to speak up and say what they actually think, more people will then also speak up and say what they actually think. And then more people will say what they actually think and we will we'll have a better understanding that we're in the majority, not in the, in the minority. And then the pressure will be on that direction instead of, in that direction, instead of the pressure being in the direction it's currently in where 
there are so many institutions that are now succumbing to these more extreme kinds of attempts to change you know, institutions and society in general um, into these illiberal authoritarian kind of totalitarian ways. Um, you know, even, from, even to the extent that accrediting bodies are now requiring private schools to have these kinds of diversity efforts. Um, it's, it's no longer possible to have the kinds of diversity efforts that, that don't involve anti-racism, you know, this very specific term. Instead of being against racism, it has to be anti-racism. These are, these are specific terms um, that have been captured and um, the pressure is now uh, very um, one-sided and, and the only way that it's going to be overcome, as Lee said, is if, if there's a tipping point. People need to speak up, people need to have the courage to actually put something at risk. Like Blake, I mean, is, a, is an amazing example of somebody who is willing to take the, the heat um, and, and Blake's friends and Blake's colleagues in the New Zionist Congress. And, you know, th this is a, a really important effort where people, you know, sometimes we just really need to, to take some hits. And unfortunately, this is a time when we're going to have to, as people who are, you know, the first to speak up. But the more that we do this, the more that other people will have the courage also. And then eventually the House of Cards will fall. Blake, I think, you know, you can speak I to think it. that that's a great note on which to end. I would say this, that there's a lot of great questions here. And what it made me think is that we need to have an open Zoom call where anybody can participate in the conversation on this issue of, of critical social justice ideology and anti-Semitism, on the issue of freedom of expression. And so um, please stay tuned. We will organize something like that. We have the Hagim coming up, Shana Tova, everybody. Um, but right after Rosh Hashanah, let's find a time that we can all get together as a network and talk through some of these issues and hear some uh, other voices as well. In the meantime, I really appreciate the deep insights of our panelists. I thought we had a very rich conversation, and I really appreciate that and really appreciate you all tuning in. Um, and thank you for your support for the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. We're really excited to be able to do this work with you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, David.